Hello, Husker fans. This is the Pick 6 podcast on Zoom on a snowstorm Thursday, uh, about uh, 11 inches in here in Lincoln, about 7 or 8 in Omaha. Sam McEwen with Dirk Chatlin and Tom Chattel, the heavy hitters on the Pick 6 podcast. Uh, we have quite a bit, actually, to discuss today, even though it's, what, February 16th. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Um, we have quite a bit to discuss. We, we sat down with Matt Rule yesterday for a little while. Uh, Tom, uh, Evan, and I, Nebraska basketball uh, has suddenly decided to do its usual late season surge under Fred Hoiberg. <laughs> They're doing it a week early, though, so you just kind of wonder what surprises may be in store. Usually they wait until the final week. In this case, they're doing it now. So they have like two weeks left. So who knows what they might do. The Nebraska baseball team opens uh, its season. We're going to have more on Nebraska baseball next week. Um, after they've had it, after they've had a weekend, um, we can talk abstractly about a team that is brand new, but we'll do that next week with Evan. We'll, we'll dive into what they do in their four game series against San Diego. We'll talk a little bit about that and just maybe the, the, the potential joy that it can bring, uh, to Nebraska athletics. Um, we'll get there. Um, but I want everybody to subscribe, 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 uh, to the Omaha world Herald. Uh, you have an opportunity to get 26 weeks of our digital coverage for $1. Today is February 15th, so that's going to take you, if my map is correct, all the way through August, the middle of August, the camp, Matt Rule's uh, Matt Drills, and uh, all the other things that uh, they're doing with Nebraska football. I think it's going to be a vastly different program in six months, so you're going to want to subscribe to that. I also want to remind people uh, that we have other podcasts, um, and one of them is the Even Field Podcast, and they have a really good podcast this week. Josie and Eileen on the Grand Island Girls Wrestling Team, and you can subscribe uh, to the Evenfield Podcast in the usual in the usual spots. But you can also find it on the Open Omaha World Herald. That's a new podcast that we've had over the last month, uh, focusing and centering on uh, women and girls sports, and that's been really really good uh, to listen to and to enjoy. Uh, all right, let's move on to Nebraska football. Uh, Tom, you met with uh, Matt Rule yesterday, as did I. Um, <clears throat> I want to go over a few general impressions that you may have had of that meeting and then just kind of what jumped out to you. Uh, me personally, I thought it was a, I thought it was a productive time that we had with them. And I was curious what you thought you've, you've talked to many, many head coaches in your life. And I'm curious who Matt rule reminds you of and how, how he struck you yesterday. Well, first of all, I, uh, I want to get one of the, uh, the local meteorologists to, um, you know, next fall we we'll, we'll, we have to make a a season prediction on a new coaching staff with new players. Uh, get one of those guys to maybe draw a line, one of those lines through there. You know, two inches, twenty inches. That line goes through Omaha, Lincoln. You know, um, two and ten, uh, ten and two. Line goes through Lincoln next year. So, yeah. Take, um, hey, can we can we point out that when when we fail miserably in our prediction. <laughs> We never hear the end of it, and the weather guys get away with it all the time. They're like the most popular people in town, and they're they're off by six, seven, ten inches at a time. Uh, the world is is terribly unfair to media, and this is the latest example. Well, well, they don't have better hair. Um, they yeah, you know, yeah, the weather the weather is a is is <laughs> one of the hardest things to do. Uh, my brother's a meteorologist, so like I was going back and forth with him over the last three or four days. And he, he actually got it right earlier in the week. He was like, it's going to be five to seven inches bank. It is what he, what he wrote me. And then he was kind of like backing off it a little bit. Like, cause I, it's just so unsure. And so challenging to try to figure out exactly what the band is going to be. And so they have these bizarre bands where it's like two to eight inches. And I'm like, that's not <laughs> two inches and eight inches are not remotely the same kind of snowstorm, you know? So, yeah, it's 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 a tough job. Somebody's. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it, Sam. They got all the technology in the world. They got they got Uzbekistan models and European models, and uh, somehow they're they're uh, they're throwing us clear clear out of whack. Uh, meanwhile, we can't mm -hmm. even see a football practice until the season opener, and we're expected to like pinpoint the win total. That's right. Matt Rule indicated he we we might get some access to some practices, right, Tom? Yeah, he wasn't he 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 was under the impression there might be four or five of us, but uh, 
He said, "Well, his like thirty, and I, I, I thought, well, that's pretty impressive. He came up with the name with the number thirty because that's how many there are." So yeah. um, he said, "Ever thirty? Probably not." So, well, I, I guess we're out of luck because there's thirty. <laughs> Unless we do it in shifts, um, but yeah, I, I was fascinated by the guy yesterday, uh, Sam. He's um, you know we, we had him, we had him for an hour, and. Um, he had he took a, a lot of questions and he handled them uh, really well. I mean, he he's a pro uh, at, at at this stuff right now. And um, like I said, I I, I just hope he can coach because he's been great at everything else. So I, I really think um, he, he's a, he's a fascinating guy in that. Um, in, in and I thought kind of the same thing about about Bill Callahan, that there was sort of like this depth to the guy and he en enjoyed breaking things down and he and he really got into uh, the football part of it. And I, th I think Matt Rule is a guy who loves football and he'll talk football all day. And if, if you ask him a question, you don't get a coach speak. You get his uh, honest answer. And um, I really thought that um, – I was impressed that he re he re remembered remembered my name after after just meeting me like halfway through it. But that that's a little thing, but it's like attention to detail thing too. So <laughs> uh, maybe I'm maybe, maybe I'm just easily impressed, which is probably the case. But um, I don't know. I I, I think it's um, and this is probably what I'm going to write for Sunday a little bit too. Is I, I'm I'm impressed. Because of, of something I, I had not seen in a lot of coaches over the years, and that he's very confident. All these guys around him are very confident in who they are and what they can do. Okay, um, yet there's a little humility with it too. There's a little bit of a we don't have all the answers. We want to learn about Nebraska. We want to learn about everything. Um, we we want to find some things out too. So. You don't usually see that those two things go together. It's usually all cocky, all confident, or the the, the other. So I kind of find that uh, Matt, he's a, he and his guys, um, his eighty coaches or whatever, are um, they all have this sort of attitude that they're very confident in what they do, but yet they're they're not above it all. They're 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 going to go meet with everybody and sh shake hands and ask questions too. So. I like I, I like the fact that he's been fired. Uh, I think that you know is a is a little bit of humility. Oh. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, I did want to go off on a quick tangent, Tom. It, you, your comment reminded me a little bit of this classic Jerry Seinfeld Dave Letterman conversation, <laughs> where uh, Letterman is commenting how Joey Gallo at a Reds game came over and like talked to him in the front row and you know, wanted to make sure that he was having a good time. And Dave just thought it was the greatest thing ever. And, uh, and what a nice guy Joey Gallo was. And, and, and Jerry Seinfeld said, it's because you're Dave Letterman. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I, I would like to point out that he probably remembers your name in part because you're Tom Chattel. So, uh, you know, let's not give him too much credit for that. Yeah. There's some cachet there that, that not everybody else has. I, you know, I've, I've been, I've, whatever, how many years I've been here, to me, it's just no big deal that I'm, I'm, I'm whoever I'm, I am, whoever I, ha I happen to be today is no big deal. So, um, but anyway, um, but yeah, I thought that was, um, I thought it was good, Sam. I think what I like about it is we're, we're going to get football answers. You know, he likes to talk football. So people in Nebraska like to hear football. So this, so far, it's it seemed like a a, 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 a a nice fit. So we'll see if he can coach and win. Yeah, I I was um there was there was a lot of interesting answers in there that he that he gave. I I thought you know um what one of them related to how they Nebraska led four games in the fourth quarter last year that they didn't win and. He he does a good job of referencing things that if you're paying attention, you know what he's talking about. Not everybody would. He just kind of he he references it without actually saying. It. So he had a comment yesterday. He said, 
and he was referencing the Northwestern game. I told the players, everyone talks about that one play that happened in the third quarter, but you had a lead in the fourth quarter. Well, we know what play he's talking about. He's talking about the onside kick, right. which in, in, in the defense of the players, they had put up with so much shit for so many years with dumb stuff happening that when that play happened, it wasn't just, you know, the bubble of the game, but it was like four years of crap. But he makes a good point that like Nebraska still led that game and they had multiple chances to win it in the fourth quarter. Then later on in that answer, he said, this is good. I like this. We're not going to be a, quote, hey, let's start fast, unquote. We're going to be a, quote, hey, let's throw body blows for four quarters and then try to win the game in the fourth quarter. Now, again, if you're paying attention, the, hey, let's start fast, who's that? That's Scott. <laughs> That's, that was it. That's, that was their, most of their plan most of the time was to let's let's try to get a 14-0 lead and then let's just let's just let's just you know hold people off. And in the time that Scott was there, they only did that about five times. They did it against Minnesota in 2018, Illinois in 2018, Maryland in 2019, a couple other games. They never in Northwestern in 2021, they didn't do it that often. And so part of what would happen is they get in these four quarter games and they lost so many one score games in part because the formula that they had always envisioned um, coming to life, never materialized because Big Ten teams learned how to neutralize Nebraska's ability to score a crap load of points early in games. And so, like, when you pay it, like, Rule has a really good offhanded understanding of what's been going on with the program and the areas in which they need to, they need to, they need to get better. Mm -hmm. I would describe him as somebody who can look at a situation and pick out a couple of issues that need to be resolved and then talk about a template that will resolve those things. Like, here's how my culture will resolve the problems that I have seen in the program. Now, that doesn't mean he has done it, but he is really good at diagnostics. And, you know, one thing that I would say about Scott, and this is a, not to really knock him, but when he came in and talked about the diagnostics of why the program hadn't been going very well. His diagnostic was somewhere along the lines of they took a couple left turns at Albuquerque and they had some bad guys in here and they didn't know what they were doing. And that wasn't true. Bill Callahan and Mike Riley were not bad human beings and they didn't take a couple of left turns at Albuquerque. There were reasons why things didn't work. And I thought Scott's diagnostics were somewhere along the lines of there were bad people, we're the good people, and we're going to win because we're good. And I think Matt Rule is a very different approach to that it's a much more detailed and honest approach as to why Nebraska has been falling short. That I appreciated about it. How about you know I thought? How, go, go ahead, Jared. How about the uh, his his work to go back and watch not only every game in 2022 but every filmed practice, like the entire practice, spring and fall. I, w I like, was just going to say that. Holy I, crap! Like that. First of all, that would be painstaking and monotonous and just absolutely horrible uh but but how many coaches have we heard, how many coaches have we heard over the years how yeah. many coaches have we heard over the years that basically say what what happened before i got here doesn't matter i'm right. going to evaluate it i'm going to evaluate it based on what i see now yeah. that is a that is a, a a starkly different approach than rule oh, is taking wow I I, I, I actually asked him that question, which might have been the only question I ever got a good answer to maybe ever in my life. But uh, no, but the, I said, I said, I wanted to get, because I have heard coaches say, I don't want to know what happened before me. So I said, have you gone back and looked at the games? He brought up the practices. And then it was almost like a little, little quiz. Uh, Sam or Evan came back and said, well, um, were there any players who stood out? Um they're coming back from last year. And he rattled off four or five names and and what he knew about them. So yeah. he was obviously telling the truth that he did this because he knew the individual guys and they weren't big names. Um, it was fascinating. I mean, this guy's got, a, you know, a good eye, like Sam said. And um, it's uh, 
I think it's it's, it's a great sign that you know. But he loves football. He been, you you only do that if you love football. It's not. Um, it's what he's saying about practice. We don't want practices to be hard, but we, we want them to, to, to. You're out there playing football. You're you're you're, you're you want to do this because you're enjoying it. So, um, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, he and, and to be clear, like I think other coaches at Nebraska's have love football. Like I, I, I what I would say is that his skill in, um. I think he understands that there's a lot to the Nebraska job and he's doing a hell of a lot of interviews. I mean, he isn't just talking with us. He's talked with a lot of people nationally, locally. He's done more interviews than probably anybody. So he, he isn't, he's not just like rebuffing that, but right. I think his ability to go in there and really examine the X's like the, the nuts and bolts of the football program to me seems a little different from even maybe not Callahan. Callahan had to change a lot of things, but certainly different from Bo, Riley, and Scott in the level of detail that's in the diagnostic. Bo is not wrong about everything. Both Bo came in and is like, we got players here, but they need to have their asses kicked and we need to we need to wake them up. And he was right. And then he wasn't able to replicate all of those players as time went on. But he did, he he had the right understanding of what that program needed when he got there. Mike Riley, I don't know. I, I you know, I just never felt like he had the best handle on everything that was going on. I think he enjoyed the job immensely and he liked practicing and coaching football without ever really handling that issue. And then I just talked about Scott. Like I I don't know that I think Scott was ambivalent about taking the job. And then when he did, you know, he I think he tried to fix some things and then it didn't go his way, but he never did the full diagnostic that Rule is doing. And one of the advantages that Rule has that Scott did not is there's just rule doesn't have to have, it isn't surrounded by anybody who who's going to constantly be telling him how things were because he doesn't, his, his confidants and his inner circle are just as new to this as him. And so one of the questions I asked him is, you know, I've seen this job. I said this very specifically, I've seen the bigness of this job overwhelm some of the predecessors in your seat. How do you learn how to say no? How do you learn how to edit? How do you how do you usher a chef out of the kitchen when they're trying to put one too many thing on the dish? That's exactly what I asked. And his response was interesting. I don't he didn't necessarily say that, like, I'm going to I'm going to make hard on people and I'm going to keep a close counsel. He's like, if you have an opinion, I'll listen to it, but I'm going to do what I'm going to do. So I think well, there's a sense of he's willing to listen, but at the same time, he's his own guy. And I think he has clear senses of that. And of course, we're you know, we're, we're praising him a lot, but it was a good, it was a good meeting. I think it was a pretty impressive conversation with him when he's dealing with very little sleep. Let me ask you this. Do, do you get, and, and you know, this is the whole thing with frost failure was to me, it was, we, we kind of have to close the book on, you know, the idea of a, of a, you know, golden boy coming in and fixing this. Like this is, this is actually broken. Everybody needs to understand that it's like, uh, that this is not an easy thing to fix anymore. Uh, this, this, this 20 years happened because, you know, for lots of different reasons, it wasn't anything simple or obvious. And it, it his actions to me tell me that, that he's taken that part of it seriously, that he's not looking for scapegoats or easy way outs, or, you know, he's, he, he's not interested in simplifying 20 years of, of failure at Nebraska like he actually wants to figure it out and take it seriously. Um, and, and to me that demonstrates obviously some intellect, but, uh, but some humility too. Um, because I think when someone like Scott with all the things that he had going for him, when someone like that fails, I think it just takes, it requires everybody in the operation to look at it and say, Whoa, <laughs> like right. th this, this, must be more complicated than we all thought. And I, I'm relieved that, that Matt rule maybe has come to that conclusion as much as anybody like, uh, okay, this is, uh, this is not, this is not going to be something that we just roll into town and put our, you know, uh, put a, put a fresh coat of lipstick on. And, and all of a sudden we win 10 games. Like he, he seems to understand it better than anybody. 
Well, you, you have to look under the hood and see what's wrong. And then I think that's what he did by going back uh, and looking at the film, which is very smart. Um, but, you know, one of the topics that's, I guess, been going around out there, um, Dirk, is that the, is this a total rebuild or not? And it, 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 it's kind of a debate. Uh, some people want it to be a start from scratch thing. And some people are saying, well, no, there's they've got players. There's some talent there. It's not a total rebuild. And I, I think it's both. And that and, I, and I, that's what Rule said yesterday, too. Um, whereas you had, do have players back, but, but they don't know how to win. They don't know how to finish fourth quarters. They don't know how to do the things uh, you, you have to do to win games all the time. Um, they have to be taught those things. Um, so th there, there is some going back to the, the drawing board and kind of going from the beginning on this. Um, but I asked him about expectations, and I'm, I'm going to write, that, write about that for Sunday. And he he basically said, we are starting from scratch, but there are some good parts here. So um, I feel like he, he – I've got the quote right here. He says we're um, we're not going to coach them like like a four win team trying to improve. We're going to um, uh, coach them like a, a, a successful team trying to uh, take the next step. So he's trying to get them to be confident right right now. So uh, you know we'll see if that works. But uh, that's kind of a fine line because people are going to ask him, you know, can you win next year? And of course he has to say yes. He He's trying to get recruits here and transfers, here, and he wants the team to think that way. But yet, they may not. You know, every all of his first years have been two or three wins. So it's um, I don't know. It, it, it's it's going to be fascinating to watch that to see how 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 he uh, you know goes about trying to get them to be confident, but yet uh, calm everybody down. <laughs> Which is hard to do around here. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think I think he's I think it's clear what he wants to be able to say is it's a rebuild in the in the sense of where Nebraska wants to go, but he is not taking over Temple or Baylor. Right. I think that's fair. Like I think what happened at Baylor is unique. And then Temple, he he let us in on a little bit of it like yesterday about the challenges they were having there. <laughs> so and some of that was off the record. The reality is that thing was, you know, that thing was a little bit of a mess when, when, when he got there yeah. and like when Al Golden took it over and it was better when Matt rule took it over, but there was still a number of challenges. I want to, I want to back to the fourth quarter thing for a second, because I think this to me is just really illuminating. Uh, maybe it isn't to anybody else, but when you look at rushing yards in the fourth quarter um, and you look at big 10 teams from last season, Nebraska um, on offense, on offense, was um, when you look at their – if you look at their fourth quarter numbers last season, Nebraska was, I think, 11th in rushing yards with 324 in the fourth quarter, but they were last in yards per carry, 2.7 yards per carry in the fourth quarter last season. Simultaneously, um, teams against Nebraska – Nebraska was ninth there and was 3.67. So teams were gaining about a yard more per game in the fourth quarter against Nebraska than Nebraska was gaining against it. Now, you go back a year, and man, is this telling. This is telling. Now. A year ago, Nebraska averaged 3.59 rushing yards per game or in the fourth quarter in 118 fourth quarter carries, 3.59. That ranked eighth in the Big Ten. The defense ranked last. They gave up 4.98 yards per carry in the fourth quarter. Last. So you notice the gap in both of those scenarios is somewhere around six or seven. They rank in the middle of the pack in one thing, and then they rank last in the other one. And if you want to talk about fourth quarter issues, that's part of the issue. When this team gets to the fourth quarter, for whatever reason, they can't stop the run, and they can't run the ball. And that's the thing that I think Matt Rule has to begin to change. Yeah, there's just a – I mean, there's just a little bit of a – even as Nebraska got better, I think, on the lines over the course of the Frost era, um, 
there was just never a sense that it was a team strength, right? And and you definitely get the sense that Rule wants to make it a strength again, uh, which mm. you know is a credit to I think part of that is just his 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 Penn State heritage, um, you know where he comes from. I think that you know he's he's sort of like from a he understands Nebraska because he understands Penn State, and and that's you know that was. Mm a huge part of his formative experience. Um, and I think he, you know, the other benefit is he just, his memories of Nebraska are so vivid being a physical football team that I think, you know, like Trev Alberts, he's, he's sort of driven to re, to renew that part of the program. And um, it's just, it's tough. I mean, it's a, it's a tough league. It's a tough, you know, side of the league. Uh, Nebraska has to get so much better up front on both sides um, because, in this league, uh, late in games, man, you just you get totally exposed if, if that's not a strength of your team. That's exactly what happened in Nebraska year after year. They were last in 2021. They were eighth in 2020. They were last in 2019. They were last in 2018 on defense. Yards per carry allowed in the fourth quarter. That- Dude, that's – you know, Sam, I think that's where um, – quarterback run game make him in handy you know you yes. know you don't do it a lot during the game but if you roll that out in the fourth quarter when the other defense is a, a little worn down that 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 can be a killer um and it, it can obviously uh you know you start getting first downs and you start you start wearing the other guy down a little bit um i think that you know we'll see what they do but um um, and they're gonna have a fullback. And the fullback is an H back or whatever it is, but uh that, that may be something up their sleeve too. So um I just get the feeling that there's um uh, um that these guys are pretty smart. And so I'm I'm curious to, to see where they use that. They, they do they do a lot of homework, obviously. Um that's that's part of their thing. Attention to detail, uh Go find out the, the 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 people of the state. Go find the culture. You know, go back and watch film. Go back and do all this stuff. You know, how, how do they use it? I'm, I'm I'll be curious next year to see how how they do that. But uh, I think there's a a little bit of a. I think the the players will, will pick up on that stuff too, and um, you know, maybe they'll be more confident and. Uh, uh, you know what? What they do going in the end of the fourth quarter, how they handle that. But I thought one of the comments he made about the fourth quarter was interesting. Was the Iowa? He said that the defense in the Iowa game is how we have to play all the time, and so he'll probably use that as a reference point. Yeah, they flew around. They <clears throat> they, they played with abandon, uh, you know, with abandonment, abandon. They just didn't. They played really hard. Yeah, that's exactly what he was saying. Um, Dirk, what do you think about the what's obviously coming with the walk-on program? It's it's not going to be the way it ever was. No, no. You, you were a big proponent of this, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not. I, I never was. Not the way that hey, you are. You and I you were a big proponent of a big roster size, <laughs> utilizing the stations and all that. And um, what you what do you think about that? Yeah, Tom Osborne and me, Sam. You gonna argue okay. with Tom Osborne? That's right. Nope. <laughs> uh, no, the, the walk-on program, uh, I think, in theory, is an amazing idea where you can essentially widely expand your margin for error, um, you know, by by building, building up guys uh, over the course of time. But um, for lots of practical reasons, you know, that we've talked about many times, you know, in-state tuition and you know, the, the, the rise of, um, you know, the rise of smaller programs where you can play earlier, um, the transfer port. I mean, there's just lots of different reasons. It's been hard to put the walk-on program into practice, um, at least, you know, to its, to its probably its full capacity or potential. Um, you know, I think Nebraska still gets a lot of really nice players out of it. I mean, I don't know where this defense would be without Luke Reimer. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to imagine that over the last couple of years, but, yep. and, and I think, you know, I hope that there's still a place for guys like that. I wish that 
Nebraska could create a practice regimen where it was it was more about development but man this title nine issue is is a real thing and you can't have that many you know athletes in your football program without paying the price in other programs if you're going to achieve equity so and i know trev alberts takes that very seriously so uh part of me part of me weeps a little bit sam but uh but i think it was inevitable too Tom, one of the things that rule kind of mentioned yesterday um, is, you know, again, this is a title line thing that Nebraska is doing. The reality is you cannot continue to, to um, just add numbers to women's teams of, of athletes that probably aren't going to do a lot for those teams just so you can accommodate an extra 30 football players. The cost of, um, so this is coming from the administration, but the cost of just handling an athlete, like just working with a football player, it's kind of hard at this point with 160 guys. It's just challenging to do all the things that you've got to do. It's not like it was 30 years ago. It's just not. There's, there, It's way more involved than it used to be. Well, and I, you know, I think, look, you know, I'm, I was, I was around for some of those old days. So I, I, I do miss those old days, but um what I remember about the old days was they they won a lot of games. If it, this is 2023, you got to find a new way to do that. Um, the rules are set up now; you can't do everything you, you used to be able to do, and a lot of the things that you used to be able to do don't work anymore. So, because the game has evolved, so I'm, I'm in the camp of <clears throat> there are uh, a, a certain principles of the brass football. Uh, the, the dynasty days that will always um, translate and go forward. Um, but you, you have to adjust. And, and for some things, and the walk-on thing is one of those. Uh, because of Title IX, it didn't impact it before. Um, another thing, when I asked him about how are you going to practice, he said, well, the, we'll have two fields going. Um, but they used to have four or five fields going. You know, they used to have uh, stations everywhere. And coaches everywhere, and you know, and uh, JV team and freshman team, and and so he's going to do it differently, and that's fine. Um, I I don't I think the why they you can still have walk ons. Um, the, the the key is to have meaningful walk ons and guys who can add depth, get on the field eventually. Uh, special teams, um, you know, maybe work your way up, but it's tougher. Because now with, with the, the transfer portal, you can go get a guy right now who's already on scholarship from somebody else. You don't need the walk the walk on. Maybe okay, walk on can help me, but so can this other guy. And I and I have nil money to, to go get this guy. So um, it, it's a different day, and um, I'm okay with that. Um, you know, you know what's what's interesting though, Tom is. Oh. His his approach to in-state recruiting and the efforts that he and Ed Foley have made to build relationships, um, you know, Ed Foley goes out to Osceola, Nebraska, yeah. um, which is 14 miles down the road from where I grew up and hasn't produced a, a Nebraska football player in 30 or 40 years uh, because there's a kid out there who might be a walk-on, you know, and it's like at some point, if you keep knocking on those doors, uh, those people expect you to take their best football player, you know? Um, and, and I think there's a little, there's going to be some, some friction um, where if Nebraska is not taken, you know, an all state kid from name your favorite town uh, at what point does that relationship break down to some degree? Because, you know, they're yeah. not, gonna, they're not going to take eight in state kids every year. Um, and if they're not going to take a, you know, a huge class of walk-ons, it's, it's going to be hard to maintain a healthy in-state relationship that, that apparently they're working so hard to build right now. Well, it, it, you're right. It, but it, it may be Joe at the barbershop who doesn't get that, but the head coaches will understand it. But the key is Matt Rule and Ed Foley and, and all the others have to go talk to them all the time. And that they they have to uh, uh, communicate to them. Here's why we're not doing this because of this or that. We don't have the numbers, um, you know. Uh, but I think 
they will take uh, a, a good share of players. Uh, maybe not everybody, but I think they will get, get those guys in there. Because I think they realize that the heart of the program is is the, uh, the in-state kid, the, the the pride. That was always what made it work. And it can make it work again. It needs to come back. Um, more of those guys, and more of those guys can play. Um, how many, you know, uh, Iowa's and, uh, you know, other K-States, others come into um, outside Nebraska now <clears throat> and get players because they, they those guys can play. So I, I think you'll still see more Nebraska kids, um, but, but everybody knows that they, they can't. But I think as long as, as they go talk to them in person and that they're not being ignored and, and, and at least, you know, hear them out, here's my complaint. Um, I think the, the coaches – the high school coaches should understand it. Um, may not like it, but they should understand it. And I think that, that, that they'll be appreciative of those guys going to see them and, you know, going out there, driving out there and explaining it to them. It's when you don't talk to them and you kind of shut them out and, and you don't take their players. That's when they get a, you know, a little, uh, what's the word, miffed. <laughs> so, but you can't make everybody happy, but um I think there'll, there'll be a, a good share of Nebraska players on a roster at all times. I, I really do. Hmm. Let's talk about Nebraska basketball. Uh, you know, you, 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 <sighs> two, you two love ripping on the Huskers. What are they sticking to it's, the two of you the last week? It's time for a mea culpa, Sam. I got to <laughs> I gotta sit down. I got to raise my right hand. I got to admit my wrongdoing, my skepticism. Fred Hoiberg is the man for the job. Clearly, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why I ever doubted him. Uh, no, I, seriously. I mean, what a what a crazy, crazy win the other night at Rutgers. Uh, a Valentine's Day surprise. Uh, yeah. A lot of a lot of very happy Nebraska basketball fans the other night. You know that we're probably getting more joy out of watching the game on TV than, than listening to their spouse at the dinner table. Um, just, uh, I, I think it, it's a real shot in the arm for, for the morale of the program that, that frankly was not trending in the right direction, uh, about two weeks ago, but you know, you beat Wisconsin and Rutgers, uh, you know, I, I don't know long-term what it means, but, but it, I think it really, really helps Fred Hoiberg, you know, get to the end of this season and make a case for, for coming back and probably making a case for why some of these players are, you know, our foundational type guys. And that was, you know, more than, you know, if you're beating, let's just, let's just state the obvious. If you're winning at a, a top, top half big 10 team with Casey Tomanaga, Sam Griesel, who was in the summit league last year, Sam Hoiberg, who was, you know, nowhere last year. Um, it's it's just a damn impressive coaching job. It's maximizing what you have. And that was, you know, probably the biggest flaw from Hoiberg the first three years. Um, he's still got to recruit, still got to get talent, still got to reshape the roster for next year. But uh, they've found a little bit of magic in this uh, in this under undermanned nucleus. Um, and if they can win a couple more, man, this is turning into a fun basketball season. What I mean, okay, so let's let's move back here for a second. Well, Casey Wait, you don't want to get, we, we Casey can't Tumanaga is, a, is, a little is bit? playing good basketball, right? What's that? The like case Casey's doing things that are that are not only like good but hard to do. He he's a really good scorer. Okay, I mean, can we not say that because he he doesn't have the right height or like what why why can't we just say he's better? He's actually pretty good because he is, isn't he? Were well, you were you expecting that a year ago watching KC Tomonaga? No. Okay. So I, I, the, the, not necessarily, but but I don't I'm not sure what difference that makes. Wait, wait a minute. What about last month? I mean, where was he all season? I think part of the answer to that is they were trying to win with the the defense. Right. Now the defense is out. They've got to go offense. I think that that's been a, a, an impressive adjustment by Fred. Um, yes. And these guys have hit shots. They've delivered. So you have to give them credit. Um, but I, I get you know, the other night I got visions of Barry Collier and Scott Spinelli 
you know, hugging in the hallway in Dallas, um, <laughs> you know, with, with pointing of uh, pointing your fingers at me and Lee Barfneck saying, I'll show you, you know, you're trying to run me out of here. Um, I don't, I'm not trying to run Fred Horberg out. I'm trying to give him help. I want them to win. Yeah. I, I stand by what I wrote. I, right. They, they could use a basketball AD number one to get the NIL going because they basically ignore that. Uh, basketball does not get their share, at least as of yet. And um, I think, you know, it's <laughs> – Trevor Alberts is got his hands full with Nebraska football. He will always be leaning that way, as he should. You want the Nebraska AD to take care of football 24-7. I believe basketball can be equally as important, and I think they should do that. So, But um, – I think Fred will be back. I think Trev wants to bring him back, and I think he will be back now. I think there's probably been enough evidence. Now, in my opinion, we don't need to measure progress until the end of the season. Well, let's wait and see what happens this next week. Um, but it's certainly lined up for them to go after three more wins. And then you've got, you've got 16, right? And, you, and then you can maybe you lose at Iowa. Oh, That's, I mean, if they, if they get to 16, 16 15, 15, they, they have I a don't understand the – um, and then you go to Chicago and whatever, you know, see what happens. But I don't understand the new NIT rules. I think I think they're in play. I think yeah. they're it, it's not like the old days. It's 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 based on the any the you know the NCA uh, basketball committee chooses the NIT now. They do. And they basically take the others who didn't make the tournament and put them in there, which means it, it goes by the ranking, strength of schedule, the Ken Palm, all that stuff. But I think. The rest of squad wins aren't. I mean, they played a lot. They played a tough schedule. I, let's calm that a little bit there. But let's just see what happens because this guy, this thing, could also flip back. But right. I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm impressed. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think I was wrong. I think I said well, at the time I wrote it, they were, they were. Yes, yeah. So, I don't think no. I mean, I and I think I just, I just said. Surprising. Whatever happens this year, I said, good or bad, keep them or not, give them some help. Give the program some help. So I, I, I stand by that. And uh, I, somewhere I salute uh, Scott Spinelli and Doc Sadler and um, all the others. Uh, Tim Miles, who's absolutely killing it at San Jose State, which is great. So, um, but man, it feels like it'll, you know, Dirk, you know this, it feels. So familiar that they would do this right now, and um, <laughs> you know, you, you bringing you know, raising, raising the hopes of all the Jack Mitchells out there. Um, <laughs> here we go again. You know, we're gonna come back next year. Yeah, we lose these guys, but these new guys are. You know, I. It's been a good coaching job, and it it feels so familiar. Yeah, you got you got Nebraska basketball fans that are like building depth charts for next year based on a starting backcourt of Sam Hoiberg and Casey Tominaga. Um and it's glorious. I mean it's a lot of fun. You know, I love is- Kay- you gotta love you gotta you gotta watch a Casey play. You, you just the guy's a character and he's it's almost like trick shots. You know, he can't hit the sometimes he can't hit the one where he's just not he where he's you know stand alone, go up um straight up and shoot. It's got to be off balance. It's got to be kind of a weird, you know, uh, shot so that he makes. But um, just the guy's enthusiasm. And that's what I love about this right now. Yeah, I, I mean. We need, we need to put aside the, the big picture and let people enjoy this. Let them, you know, let, you know, with all Casey's lead right now, just, God, they're having fun. Just go have fun. The people love the people still show up. So that you could say, well, that's their fault. Maybe if they didn't show up, they could, you know, take it more seriously. But I'm not going to blame them. It's it's a fun team to watch. Has been all season. They have a lot of good wins. Um, but it's I just let's just enjoy it for what it is, and then take stock after the season. Sam, the beauty of sports. <clears throat> I, I I'm going to take you out to an to an open gym, the YMCA. The schoolyard, the blacktop, you pick it. On one hand, on one side of the court, I'm going to show you 
Alonzo Verge and the McGowan's brothers. On the other hand, I'm, on the other side, I'm going to show you Casey Tomanaga, uh, Sam Hoiberg, and Sam Greasel. Sure. Who you pick? Who you picking to win that three on three game, Sam? Who are you picking to win that three on three game? I probably pick Verge and the McGowan's brothers. And and who's actually been better for Nebraska basketball in the grand scheme? Well, no, 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 no. Yeah. You answer the question. I'm holding your feet to the fire. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't. I mean, Derek Walker's a. The thing that I, we, we we always said about Bryce, and this is not his fault or anything, is he's he was super talented, but Bryce did not exactly contribute to winning because a lot of what would happen within the program last year, not that he wasn't a good player, but a lot of what he did was, well, that's Bryce just kind of does that every night, and whether or not they win or not is immaterial to he has to get his 20% of his, his shots. And it was like, let's clear out and let's let him go do something. And it wasn't it wasn't within the structure of the offense. Now that doesn't mean that I mean Casey's taking a ton of shots, but where he takes the shots and what he's doing with them is in the structure of what Fred Hoiberg's doing. It's not clearing out, he's getting threes off of screens. And then the thing that's really notable about Casey is that I don't know what his percentage is at the rim, but it's high. Like he does he he, he hits circus shots. He's able to hit circus shots. All the time. And so, like, you know, that to me is a skill. Like, it's not it's not a joke. And it's not luck. He's he's really good at it. And that part of his game is what's been notable. Like, yes, he's hitting the threes that they always thought he could. But what's really notable is that he's getting about eight points a game at the rim. And 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 that's more than Alonzo Verge was getting. And that's more than Trey McGowan's was getting. <clears throat> yeah, and they might be better basketball players but they can't do what he's doing at the rim. Yeah. And, and I think you have to give credit. I mean, I feel bad for Gary and Bandamel, uh, but I think this culture kind of started with those guys. I mean, there was just a, there was an intensity and mentality that you could see it from the, from early on in the year. And I think it's just kind of carried over. Uh, I still, you know, in classic Nebraska basketball fashion, at one point you're saying to yourself, boy, this is amazing. They're beating Rutgers on the road. And, and I'm, you know, in almost the exact same thought you're saying, gosh, it's too bad. You couldn't see him at full strength, you know, cause I, I, I think you're potentially looking at an NCAA tournament bubble team. If they're at full strength right now. Uh, and, and granted it might've played out a little bit differently with Tominaga and with, you know, with Sam. Uh, but, but uh, just, Really, really impressive. After many years, uh, certainly three years of, of watching Nebraska get very little out of its talent, suddenly Fred feels like he's maximizing his talent. And mm. and, and and here's the thing um, about Fred. He was very good at Iowa State. I mean, the guy, yeah, he hit on, hit on a couple of very good players, but he was very good there. And so maybe he's finally found something here that he – he can he can use uh, the style. Um, these guys are very confident now, but they, like you said, the the culture, the defense. Um, can he go? Can he can he go find replacements um, this 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 off season? Um, maybe he's got something going here. Um, and in the Big Ten, it doesn't take much. Um, the Big Ten really? isn't great. It's it's uh, it's even you know even at the top. Nebraska has has been close to those teams, so I don't know, Dirk. It's um, when I learn about Nebraska basketball, I'll just <laughs> sit back and watch and uh, see what happens. But um, this is surprising and yet not surprising. But um, I again, um, I think it'd be hilarious if they found their way into the NIT. I mean, wouldn't that be something? Um, I would actually, Mr. NIT, I would actually celebrate that. So yeah. you know, I'd get my old banner out, the NIT banner, you know. And um, um, For way, younger listeners, uh, when, when Nebraska won the NIT title in 1996, was it? You wrote a column, and how did it start? <laughs> We're number 65. We're number 65. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's some history to that <laughs> I was such a smart ass back then um, well 
that that team was extremely dysfunctional and more ta- way more talented than an NIT banner. I mean, that team it, by all rights should have should have gone to uh, the NCAA tournament, and maybe to the Sweet Sixteen. If you think about the 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 quality of player on that team, Teron Lou, Mikey Moore, Eric Strickland, Jerron Boone. I mean that that, that should have been a twenty five win team. It was not. So it was appropriate at the time. I contextually it made sense. I can still hear him yelling at me in the locker room in Ames, Iowa. I can still hear it. <laughs> Bernard Garner I can still hear him. Any thoughts on Nebraska baseball before we get to a special announcement at the end? Uh, I have not uh, gone there yet, Sam. Um, yeah. I'm going to dive into the Evan Bland uh, chapters here soon. Um, Pretty much it is. Yeah, it's a book. There's like three thousand words on Nebraska baseball today. They've got a bunch of bunch of new guys, and I think he did that on purpose, obviously. Um, but they've got to keep pitchers healthy. Uh, you need a little leadership, but um, I still feel good about about, about Will Bolt, and I, he's going to figure something out. And um, maybe they didn't handle uh, success well last year. Um, but maybe they'll I, – I, I expect to bounce back and um, just get to Omaha. And I'm not talking about the World Series. I'm talking about the Big Ten Tournament. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's all I got. Well, one of the things about that team, and Evan's going to – has already talked about it, but he'll cover it more too, is just that uh, in an era where a lot of teams are hitting home runs, Nebraska did not hit a ton last year, and they were trying to – I think they got out over their uh, out over the box, so to speak, a little bit, and and I think they they got out of rhythm offensively. Um, if if your if your head coach wants you in college baseball to put pressure on a defense by doing the things that you're supposed to do, which is um, hitting to the other side, bunting, running. In my opinion, as anathema as that can be in the major leagues, I do think it can work in college baseball. I, I don't think college baseball defenses are nearly good enough to handle some of the things that would have been true, for example, the best major league teams in the eighties. So if that's what they want to do, that's fine, but they're going to have to do it. Um, And last year they got betwixt and between where they were stuck in their coach. I think kind of wanted them to play that way. And what they were trying to do is uh, you know, what we used to say with, with LSU, just trying to hit a three run home. Um, You know, they're trying to be Lyle Mouton. So LSU, by the way, has um, will have one of the great home run teams of all time this season. They they will hit many, many, many home runs this year, and they are a favorite to get to the Gulf of Series. Nebraska won't hit a ton of home runs, and they're going to have to win another way. Uh, so if they can if they can manufacture and generate runs by running and 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 moving guys station to station, which is a, a term of derision in Major League Baseball, but in college baseball it can still work. And then um, Nebraska's pitchers have to be they got to attack. They they have to attack the strike zone. They have to uh, they have to be really aggressive and competitive early in the season. You don't have a lot of time. You've got to go out and win games early. Um, you have to you have to force hitters to do stuff. You can't you can't log a bunch of walks. And you know um, I don't know what you want to say. Just play cute with the strike zone. Can't do it. And and they didn't do a lot of that last year. But but you can't early in the season. You have to you have to attack and. And if they do that, then I think they'll be okay this weekend and the subsequent weekends. They have a big weekend in three weeks where they play Ole Miss and a few other teams. So uh, that's where we are with Nebraska baseball. Now, at the end of this Pick Six podcast, uh, we have a special announcement, and so I'll, I'll let that I'll let that commence. Um. Well, this is uh this is hard. You know, this is sort of a long, slow, uh, aching goodbye. Um, but uh, I'm leaving the World Herald this month as you guys know, and, um, it's kind of, uh, been in the works for a little while here. Um, so this will be my last podcast appearance, at least for a while. Uh, maybe I can pop in as a guest, you know, every once in a while. Um, but, but this is, you know, sort of an end, an end of a run for me, 18 years, uh, 19 years, something like that. Full-time on staff, uh, 20 years since I was an intern and, uh, Grew up reading the World Herald. It's it's been totally a dream job. Um, 
I'm going to write about it in a column for next week, I think. But yes, um, but but I in that column, I write about, you know, being a kid on the living room floor and and waiting for my dad to come home from work and throw the sports section on the on the living room floor where I could dive into, you know, what Tom Chattel was writing about the Huskers. And and here, you know, spent 18 years working with Tom and, and lots of other fantastic people. And it's, um, it was, it was my decision to leave. Um, I have sort of been trying to get Sam to, to let me go part-time for a while. And, you know, he's been kind enough to just urge me to keep doing as much as I can. But, uh, I was, I was, uh, I was ready to try some new, to try some new things and I'm, I'm not leaving town. I don't have a job lined up. Uh, but, but it's kind of, it's kind of time for me to, to look outside the box a little bit. So um, hopefully I can still contribute to the world Herald sometimes. Hopefully I can see you guys around. Um, but uh, this is uh, this, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say this, this was going to be a real big personal challenge for me. Um, I, I, I approached my wife this morning and I said, part of me feels like I'm dying. And she said, well, that's because part of you is dying. So uh, this is going to be a really hard time and I'm going to miss you guys a lot and I'm going to miss our, our audience a lot. Uh, mm. Dirk, you know, I, 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 I deeply appreciate your friendship. This is odd to do over zoom, <laughs> but we've talked obviously in, in previous weeks. Um, I deeply pre- appreciate your friendship. Um, I'm, I'm honored to, to be, uh, working at the same place as you. Um, your work has, has been, uh, you know, it's like been a Gatsby's green light for so many journalists, including me, of just wanting and aspiring to do the kind of work that you do, um, especially on Nebraska athletics. And this is a Nebraska athletics podcast, but especially on that, like especially on the the people that you have covered over the years. And I was thinking about all of the stories that you have written, all of the the feature stories that you've written about various people who have moved in and out of Nebraska football and Nebraska athletics in general, Bubba Starling, uh, all the things that you wrote about Bo Pelini. And I know there's an interesting relationship there. Um, Chris Kiffin, Sam Keller, uh, Sean Watson telling you one time you don't get it. And of course he got it completely. And Sean Watson was gone like two months later. Um, all of the stories that you've just written over the years, uh, the amount of care and love that was put into that, the amount of humor. Not everybody's funny in this world. Uh, more, there are more sports writers in the world who think they're funny than there are that actually are, obviously. But you actually are funny and, and was able to write that in your columns. Um, it's just been an honor. And, uh, and your insight, particularly into Nebraska athletics, has always been so valuable to me because um, even though we, we, I think we both know the teams pretty well um, we have different perspectives and your perspective has been so valuable to me because uh, as I've, I was kind of, as I've been thinking about it, like you're, you're the voice of so many Nebraskans, like the way that Nebraskans look at the world, the, the deep faith and yet the hope and the, the heart that they have. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. That's where I'm from. And I'm from, you know, central Omaha, a little bit of West Omaha. And it's just different than the heart of Nebraska. And you have the heart of Nebraska. And for many, many years, you know, you, you were able to write that. And I'm just so thankful that you, you've done that for us. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm not very good at, uh, speeches. Um, but, um, I, I'm, I, 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 I can I can write a few speeches, maybe, but not give them. Um, yeah, Dirk, you're um, you've been, you've been legendary here, um, and uh, you're you're a short time, <laughs> nineteen years. Uh, where did that go? Um, I think you've. Um, I write from the heart, but I can't write from your heart because you grew up here and you that's something in our sports section needed. And um, you, 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 you delivered it time and again, you were able to step into the, the, the hearts and the minds of the Nebraska people. Um, and uh, it's, it's a valuable thing. People, you know, 
they they love that that they want to know that we uh understand and that they can come to us and um they're gonna they're gonna know that that we get it we get them that you know and um it's almost like having a friend that um you can lean on and um yeah you, you've been that for the nebraska readers um time and again i um you know i i grew up um you know i've, I've always worshipped sports writers i've always uh tried to learn um i learned how to type on an old typewriter when i was 13 um i get the the old sporting news magazine out and i type the columns uh you know, Joe Falls, Art Spander, uh, Dick Young, all these crazy old guys uh, from way back when. I would, I would just retype their comics if I learned how to type. But um, when, I, when I got to meet them, I asked some questions, and and um, I've always tried to learn from you know the old guys. But you're a young guy that, that I, 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 I I I got I got I got I got, I got, I got that I got to learn from um, just by reading. Your, your different approach, your different take. It was always fascinating. Um, I learned a lot. Um, you may be envious. The the 24th and glory, uh, I wish I'd done that. And uh, and it also made me proud but, um, to know you. But, um, you know, yeah, yeah, I just close for now because I'll see you again. Hopefully yeah. on the golf course someplace. Um but you, you you made me better, and I, I really I really thank you for that. I, I appreciate it, and um, well, uh, I'm sure I'll see you again. You're, um, you know, one thing I uh, somebody told me a long time ago, and uh, I use this all the time. Um, um, writing and writing a column is is what I do. It's not what I am. I'm a dad and a husband. And uh, I, I would just leave you with that uh, as, as you go forward. So, salute. I appreciate you guys. If I had, if I had a cocktail, I'd uh, give you that too as well. <laughs> well, I appreciate you guys. This is all going to feel sort of anticlimactic because you're going to see me so often. So, uh, but I, I really appreciate. Uh, yes, we are going to see you often. <laughs> That's I, right. I, I appreciate your friendship. And uh, I really, really appreciate our, our readers and listeners because, you know, I. I always considered, uh, and I know you guys are the same way. I always considered the readers our bosses, uh, and and it's uh, they they keep you keep you in line. And uh, I, I really really have appreciated their loyalty over the years. Cool. Amen to that. Uh, there will be uh, more on uh, Dirk's departure in the following week. We wanted to make sure that we scheduled it in a way that didn't coincide with a massive state wrestling tournament and now also a massive store story, as it turns out. So, um, yeah, it'll it'll be in the World Herald. Um, just just what we think of him and, and what some of his sources have thought of him over the years. Um, you've written so many wonderful stories and illuminated people in ways that, again, I, I don't I don't I lack that gift. You have it. And I am grateful um, to to have read it for so many years. So, um, but yeah, like I think guest appearances on the Pick Six podcast will be will be good, and we're going to have some other guest appearances on the Pick Six podcast as well. Um, people should expect Tom and I to continue. Uh, we will be continuing, and we'll have Evan, and we'll have some other folks too. And um, we we thank you so much. We thank the listeners a lot um, for. We made a change in this thing about six months ago. Wish I'd made it sooner. Uh, wish we had done this for many years. Um, but we made a good change, and I think it's been really, really fun. It's changed my outlook on this podcast, so um, I'm going to miss that. But we're going to continue for it. We're going to soldier on. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's that's where we're at. Any any other thoughts, Dirk? Nope. Thank you guys so much. It's uh, it's just been a joy, and uh, you know if. Uh, if you ever need me to freelance a high school basketball game, just give me a holler. I'll try to make it in a small gym somewhere in the middle of Nebraska. For Dirk and Tom, I'm Sam. This is the Pick 6 Podcast. Thanks for listening and reading, everyone. Mm-hmm.